Um, so today I'm just going to start with new material, and then uh, if you have questions on Friday, I'll answer questions on Friday. Um, and obviously, if you, you know, you can always come to office hours or email me if you have questions that you want answered before then. Um, so now we're getting into the next topic. Uh, that's particle kinetics. <laughs> okay, so sounds like particle kinematics, but it's different. So, um, kinematics is um, describing motion without uh, dealing with the causes of the motion and we, we can think of the causes of the motion as force, mass, uh, energy. Um, we're moving on now to kinetics. And uh, kinetics still involves kinematics. Um, you're still using, uh, and actually up here, basically what this is, is relationships between time, position vector, velocity vector, and acceleration vector. Um, kinetics is combining kinematics with the causes of the motion. So now we're going to start talking about mass and force and energy later on. Um, for particle kinetics, Um, if we're using a Newtonian approach, uh, so a Newtonian force is one uh, approach is one where you're dealing with forces, not energy. Um, there's one equation of motion. And that's Newton's second law. I'll abbreviate that N2L. Um, and by equation of motion, I mean an equation that relates the kinematics to the causes. Um, so if you're given the causes of the motion, you can figure out what the thing is going to do. And uh, Newton's second law says, add up all the forces on the chosen body. I'll write the detailed meaning of each of these below. Um, add up all those forces, that's equal to the mass of the chosen body times the acceleration of the center of mass of the body. If you're dealing with particles, uh, you're only dealing with the center of mass. But remember that, um, so, right, if you picture me in a rigid body doing this, at every instant, the acceleration of this fingertip is actually it's opposite, but it's definitely different than the acceleration of this fingertip. Okay? So if you add up all the forces acting on me as I do that, um, 
the sum of those forces can't equal the mass times acceleration of this and the mass times acceleration of this. They, they don't agree with each other. Okay? There's only one point on a body where that law holds, and that's at the center of mass. Um, so F net, this is the sum of force vectors applied to the chosen body. M is the mass of the chosen body. And ACOM is the acceleration vector of the chosen body's center of mass. Um, so this is going to be, I mean, this equation is going to come up in every, every problem that we do in this topic. Um, you can see from the definitions of these quantities that specifying a chosen body is going to be a key part of this. Um, so obviously... specifying, you know, and being clear about what your chosen body is. Um, is a key step. And um, so to be clear to ourselves, and I guess whoever is looking at our calculations, um, about what the chosen body is, what the boundaries of the chosen body are, uh, we're going to draw free body diagrams. And you need to use a free body diagram, draw a free body diagram for every application of Newton's second law. Okay. Um, so we're going to draw free body diagram uh, we'll call that FBD um, yeah in this class yep for every application of Newton's second law Okay, so here's what a free body diagram is. Um, different people have different, uh, you know, do these different ways, and probably most of those people are pretty sure that their way is the only way to do it. Um, but here's how I want you to do it in this class. Um, I want you to first draw a closed outline of the chosen body um, with no external objects and no internal details. Um, no external objects, by the way, is the free and free body diagram. So we're taking the thing that we're isolating it, and that's the only thing that we're looking at. And anything in, it, in the environment 
we're going to represent just simply as the forces that it applies to our chosen body, to our free body. Um, so if you're doing a free body diagram of a person or a gingerbread man, um, there's a closed outline. Uh, this is not a closed outline. And the reason that that matters is because we're trying to be really clear about the boundary. That's so everything that happens inside the boundary is uninteresting to us. Everything that happens at the boundary is important. Okay. So uh, if you if you draw just a stick figure like this, um, well, are we including you know organs or whatever like? Where the boundary is, is not clear. I mean, it's probably clear to you, or it might be clear to you, but uh, you want to give more details about where that boundary is. Um, so what this says is we don't care about the forces of the blood acting on the arteries, or the forces of the arteries acting on the blood, or the forces of the teeth on each other, you know, any of that stuff. All we care about are the forces that stuff outside that boundary, the forces they apply to the boundary. Okay. Um, and uh, no external objects means Don't do that. And um, you can do that, but that's that's not a free body diagram. Okay. Like you can draw, I mean, I think it's almost never the wrong step to draw more pictures of what's going on to get a sense of what's, you know, to orient yourself to the problem. But your free body diagram should not have anything that is not your chosen object. Okay. So the grass there, it looks nice. I mean, I'm all for drawing grass, but not in the free body diagram, you know. Um, and then in addition to the closed outline, um, include all external loads acting on the chosen object. Um, and I'm going to break this up into two possibilities. Uh, one is that you know the direction of the load. Um, and loads, I'm going to think of this as a combination of forces and couples. Couples won't matter yet. Uh, we'll get to those when we talk about rigid bodies. When we're talking about particles, the only loads that matter are forces. Um, if the force direction is known, then draw the force as an arrow in that direction, that known direction. And label that arrow with a scalar Uh, number or variable. So, for example, um, if you're drawing a free body diagram of a car, okay, 
there's the closed outline. And then if it's being, you know, if a force is being applied, you know it's this way. You draw the arrow in the direction that it's known. And then the variable associated with it is just a number, it's not a vector. Okay. Um, what that is going to let us do is uh, figure out how many variables we're introducing into the problem. Um, because what this is saying is take the unit vector in that direction and multiply it by that number. Okay. And so to represent this vector, even though a vector has two dimensions, we only have one unknown that we have to solve for. <laughs> and by the way, uh, if this C is negative, that means that we have a vector going in the opposite direction. Okay. So um, where I see this done wrong most often is when people draw weight force vectors. So draw a downward force and then write a negative mg on it. Okay. The downward is already the direction. If you multiply that then by a negative number, it continues that gravity is going up, which you can't count on. Yes? Yes, it's fine to do that. Just know that that's what it does if, if it's a negative value. Yep. And uh, the other possibility is if the force direction isn't known, um, then draw arrows. in the directions of the coordinate axes. And label that with a vector variable or value. So if I use that car example again, uh, let's say we're dealing with the force that's applied to the car by the ground at the front wheel. Um, you can represent that like this and label it with a force F or what I think is maybe more common. Um, so on the left is the way I do it, but this is probably the way more people do it. Um, so this is the component Fx, and this is the component Fy. But it means the same thing. In both cases, you can look at that and tell that there's two variables we need to solve for. Okay. So do we know that this force, that these force components are both going to be positive when we solve for them? No, that's just saying that if the number is positive, I mean, that's saying that each of these components, that's kind of the unit vector representing it. So if you do the calculations and Fx ends up being negative 5, then that says that you have a vector component with a magnitude five going in the negative x direction. Okay. So the, the signs in that case will just work out for themselves. So when you draw those, you want to draw those default component directions in the positive axis directions. Okay. Let the signs work out on their own. All right. Uh, when we talk about force, a force applied to one body by another body. Oh no, wait, I need to say something before that. Uh, 
ground yourself with this calming fact. Um, the only forces acting on the chosen object are field forces. That mainly just means gravity in almost, you know, every case in this class. Um, but it also can mean magnetic fields, electric fields. You know if you're dealing with a field uh, that you have that's important, you know, if you're in that application. Yep. No, um, that's a good question. So. Um, Okay, so the meaning of um, the meaning of a field force is it's the same thing if you remember conservative forces in physics one. Yeah, I mean you might not remember in detail, but you probably remember hearing that term. But um, the idea of a conservative force or a field force is that if you know the location of the object, that's enough information to specify the force that's applied, okay? Um, so gravity, if, if we're thinking of things as pretty much at the surface of the earth, you know, like uh, we always, um, in all of our calculations, we're gonna treat gravity as if it applies a force of mg downward, okay? That's an approximation that's just assuming we're close to the surface of the earth. Uh, it gives good results anywhere from the lowest point below sea level to the top of Mount Everest. It, it gives pretty good results. But if you get out into orbit or whatever, it doesn't give good results anymore. Um, but so ask yourself, so this stapler, okay, we know the mass of this stapler. If I tell you the location of this stapler, is that enough to know the force that gravity applies to it? And gravity is actually an extra simple case when we're using that approximation. I don't even have to tell you the location. And you know that the force is the mass times 9.81 down, okay? And so gravity, you can think of as, it's a conservative force. Uh, you can think of it as a field. And the word field just means, you know, what does it mean uh, to, um, yeah, so like, a, yeah, a field of, let's think of a field of something, like a field of daisies, okay? A field of daisies, the idea is that wherever you go, there's a daisy there, okay? A field of forces, the idea is that these latent forces are just waiting there in space for the stapler to get there. And when the stapler gets there, it then that force is already ready for it, kind of. Okay, so that's what the word field comes from. You sort of follow what I mean? So um, not all forces work that way. Uh, like friction force, is it enough for me to specify that this stapler is going to be at this point to know what the friction force is? No, because if it's sliding to that point this way, the friction force is that way. If it's sliding this direction, it's the other way. Okay, so most forces don't have that property where the location is enough information, okay? But that's what field forces are. It's like a force waiting there for it. Um, gravity, magnetic field, electric field. Distributed loads just mean that the, that the force is spread out over, you know, some area. So you can have a, you can have a friction force that's a distributed load, but it's not a, it's not a field force. Okay, that was too long an answer for sure. Um, 
I'll probably go in later and edit out like half of the words, every other word. Um, and then, so once you've dealt with the field forces, that's gravity, and then probably that's it, but maybe an electric field or a magnetic field or something like that. Then the only other thing that you have to deal with are um, contact forces. between the surroundings and the boundary of the object. So in a complicated problem where you look at it and your brain sort of wants to uh, freak out, just remind yourself that Basically, um, represent the gravity force, the weight force, and then represent the force wherever the surroundings contact the boundary boundary And then you know you're done. It doesn't matter how complicated the problem is, that's all you're trying to do. Okay, so like if you have a problem, like you're asked to calculate this thing where this is mud and then uh, there's this pig stuck in the mud And um, there's someone on the bank of the mud pit trying to pull the pig out with a rope. And uh, this person. <laughs> you can see the sweat. And uh, this person is uh, wanted for multiple parking violations. So there's like a police car trying to pull this guy away. Um, and there's a bird on the pig. Um, thanks. And you, you know, the idea, uh, there's a helicopter, uh, sitting on the, you know, waiting in case it needs to get deployed. Police helicopter. Um, let's stop there. Uh, what are the forces on the pig? Well, there's all this stuff going on that affects the forces on the pig. Uh, the police car is pulling on the guy. 
the police, how hard the police car can pull is affected by uh, the weight of the helicopter. Um, how hard is the man pulling that affects how hard the police car can pull. All this stuff is affecting how likely the pig is to get out of the mud. But all you have to do in the free body diagram is make sure that you represent the pig's weight. And then go around the boundary and look for objects that are in contact with the pig's boundary. Um, so there's a force from the mud. There's a force from the bird. There's a force from the rope. And that's it. So the free body diagram is going to have four forces on it. A force from the mud, uh, sorry, a weight force, and then force from the mud, the burden, and the rope, and all this other stuff. It affects, I'm not saying it. the other stuff going on doesn't affect the forces acting on the pig, but the only there's only those four forces acting on the pig, okay? So do you see how like in a crazy problem like this, that could be sort of a simplifying uh, sort of touchstone? All you're doing is going weight and going around the boundary. That's better. Okay, uh, so now uh, for for force vectors, um, we're going to use this uh, double subscript naming convention. So this double subscript notation for force vectors. And this will also be true for a couple vectors. Later on. And there, uh, you know, the basic idea is that you just have this force is named by two subscripts, one that describes <coughs> the chosen body and one that describes the thing that's applying the force. Um, and you can do it in either order, you know, as long as you know which order, you know, as long as it makes sense to you, uh, which subscript what represents which. In this class, um, I'm going to use the subscript, and you should use this too, uh, force AB is the force vector. on body A applied by body B. Um, and I want to make sure that, so notice You can use this for vectors or vector components. But don't use this. for forces with known directions. Does 
So what I mean is in this example, so in this case where we have a car with a force magnitude T applied in this direction, don't write this as the force on the car by the cable or something, okay? Because, uh, because that force has a known direction, and so we've drawn that arrow in some specific known direction, okay? If you, if you use that double subscript notation with this, it'll end up messing up the way you think of Newton's third law and some other stuff, okay? Um, so only use this for vectors and components of vectors. Um, all right, so Newton's third law. Uh, when I use this, I'll call it N3L. Um, this is the one that says for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Um, but with that wording, it's pretty hard to use this law in a careful mathematical way. Uh, so for us, we can just think of the meaning this way. The force on body A by body B is negative force on body B by body A. So if you switch the subscripts, you have to switch the signs, okay? That's the benefit of that double subscript notation. Um, well, we're not using that double subscript notation for forces with known directions. So how do you use Newton's third law with known directions? Um, so that's just going to work like this. Uh, for forces, <clears throat> um, sorry, let's say for contact forces, with known directions, Um, so let's say that we have body A here in contact with body B. Then a free body diagram of body A. That force has a known direction like that and a magnitude R, and then a free body diagram of B has that same magnitude R, and you just draw the vector in the opposite direction. Um, Notice though that, I mean, just to bring these two ways of doing it together, notice that, so this, if this is how we represent this force with a known direction, okay? We could also represent that in vector components based on that scalar R. And you could think of that whole vector as the force on A by B, and that's a vector. It's just that there's only one variable in there. It's not two unknowns, it's only one. Um, 
And you could think of this one as the force on B by A. And if you switch the arrow direction like this, follow these rules, then those vectors are going to be equal and opposite. Um, okay, so uh, I said what you do if you have forces with unknown directions. Um, I said what you do if you have forces with known directions. Uh, there are three force types with known directions that we're going to deal with, besides gravity, I guess. I'm, I don't have a section on that, but gravity acts down, magnitude is mg. Um, so. Here are the three forces, the three, I guess, contact forces that we're going to have to deal with that have known directions. Um, the first one is a pushing contact. Second one is a pulling contact. And you can think of this as being applied by a cable. Even if there's uh, even if there's no cable in the problem, you can always think of it as like there's a little invisible cable that's that things are being pulled by. Um, and then the third one is friction. Okay, so the first one, pushing contact. Um, the direction of that force is always perpendicular to the surface of contact. and toward the chosen body. So for example, if you have these two carts in contact with each other. Let's say there's 500 newtons applied this way. Then a free body diagram of A. as the weight, so I'll call that ma times g down. And now all we have to do is go around the boundary looking for contact with the surroundings. Um, there's a pushing contact the ground, from the ground. The ground is pushing up on the wheel. So I'll call this, you know, these are just variable names. You can call it whatever you want. But I'm going to call it n for normal and a. There's really one at each of these two wheels, but um, since this is still particle stuff, really everything we're treating like it like it happens at the same point. And then there's a pushing contact from cart B. Um, so again, just like with this normal force, that's perpendicular to the surface of contact toward the chosen body. So like that.
um, and the free body diagram of V There's a weight force of MB times G. Uh, there's a pushing contact from the ground. So that's perpendicular to the surface of contact toward the chosen body. So I'll call that NB. And if I just keep going around the boundary, now that 500 Newton force is applied to this one. It wasn't applied to the other one because it didn't act on its boundary. And then over here, there's a pushing contact and Newton's third law says, switch the direction, change the label. Uh, switch the direction, keep the label the same. Don't change the label. Okay, I have two minutes to do this other one and I really wanna get to this point. So um, we'll do friction next time, but. Um, the second one is pulling contact. And you can always think of this as being done by a cable. And the rule for the direction of a pulling contact is parallel to the cable. away from the chosen body. So pushing was toward the chosen body, pulling is away. And so um, if you have a cable connected to the ceiling, And so let's call this body A. Then a free body diagram of A. There's a weight force of the mass times 9.81 meters per second squared. There's the 50 Newton force this way. And then the pulling force applied by that cable is parallel to the cable away from the chosen body. And with cables, usually I label these with a capital T for some sort of program. That's just a variable name. Um, And often we're going to use the fact that a cable's tension, that value T, is constant over the length of a cable. Um, you can make that assumption if you have the following things. Uh, well, the cable is weightless. And any pulleys that the cable passes over are frictionless and massless. Okay, so if you had to estimate in all the systems of pulleys and cables in the world, uh, what fraction of them have weightless cables and frictionless and massless pulleys? Yeah, so none, it's an approximation, but it actually is a pretty useful approximation a lot of the time. So for now, we're gonna make this assumption 
later on i'll talk about how to introduce some of those things that could change this okay any questions Whew, that was a lot okay so uh i'll give you some homework questions related to this and bring questions on friday and i'll answer homework questions <laughs>